All right, Patrick McGinnis, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So you got a book out called The 10% Entrepreneur, um, which is kind of an interesting name for an entrepreneur. Usually when you think entrepreneur, like you go all in, you're putting skin in the game, you're putting soul in the game, but you're saying that you can actually be an entrepreneur and just put 10% of your life or your money into it. Um, so what do you mean by that? And are you a 10% entrepreneur and how did you become one? Yeah. So that, first of all, that is absolutely uh, correct. I mean, I think a lot of people come at it at the all or nothing mindset. I, I call it the old, the Mark Cuban perspective, which is this idea that if you're not living in a, you know, apartment in the middle of nowhere, eating ramen every night, you sort of putting everything you have into a startup, somehow your chances of success are a heck of a lot lower. And what I am really want to explain to people and the perspective I'm bringing to the table is the fact that in fact you can customize entrepreneurship to your life in a way that works for you and the reason I came to this realization was because I actually did it so I was working on Wall Street everything was great and in 2008 I was working for a division of AIG and although our division had nothing to do with all of the things that happened at AIG that brought the company down didn't really matter and I had stock then that I had bought up over time that fell 97 percent in the space like a week. And I realized that this safe, conventional corporate lifestyle uh, was hardly safe. And in fact, I'd gotten it wrong the whole time. And that even though I thought entrepreneurship was so inherently risky and that I couldn't have entrepreneurship as part of sort of my life, I realized that in fact, I should have been thinking about it completely differently and used entrepreneurship to diversify myself while holding down that day job. And so that's what I started to do. I actually started, I basically took 10% of my savings and then tried to allocate about 10% of my time to doing things on the side. And since that time, I've invested in over 20 projects, everything from startups that some of you have heard of, we can talk about later, to real estate projects, to even, um, I invested in the London stage production of The Last King of Scotland. So it's it's been a really great way for me to diversify and actually to learn what it means to be an entrepreneur. And what I've learned as I've done that and what I try to bring into the book is the fact that we can engage with entrepreneurship in all kinds of different ways. And it's not just about the all or nothing. And where do you think that idea of all or nothing came from? Um, I mean, it's, yeah, I, it's out there. Yeah, I, I think – I think that there is a reality that if you want to scale a business to be an extraordinary large company, you do need to put all of your effort into it. But the problem with that mindset is that you leave out lots of people who could be entrepreneurs in different sorts of ways. So, for example, if you look at the people who are entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley or in all over the world, oftentimes in tech sector, they're people who are working full-time building a business. And they're typically either people who are willing to live very inexpensively because the average startup founder makes about $50,000 in a place like New York City or in Silicon Valley. So you that's you know it goes towards people that are very young or maybe don't have a family to support, or it goes to people who've made money in their previous jobs, or it goes to people that have family resources and they can call upon those resources. And that's totally fine. The problem is that leaves out everybody else. And so you, know, you always hear these stories about the person who persevered, who put everything into something and overcame, but there are lots of other people who are involved around them as investors, advisors, or who started something on the side and then eventually joined it full time when there was insufficient data to say that it was worth doing. And those those stories are less, I guess they're, they're less you know, sort of glamorous to tell, and they don't play into the industry narrative about throwing everything, caution to the wind, jumping in full, and and sort of going in, in, in I think, in a relatively cavalier manner until you succeed or fail. Right. And you also talk about, I thought it was interesting, because I've noticed this as well, is in the sort of entrepreneurship culture, there's, this, there's a business that has sprung up to support entrepreneurship. You call it Entrepreneurship Inc., where yes. the companies, coaches that will tell you how to be an entrepreneur. That is right. And and what I noticed as I was doing all of my 10%, and I've been an venture capitalist for many years, so I've invested in companies throughout my career. And I always noticed that when I would go to these events uh, that were entrepreneurship focused, I mean, I think it's great that there's passion. And I think there has to be some level of hype around this because it's a hard path. And so if you can't feel excited about being an entrepreneur, I mean, what's going to keep you going when you're on day 43 of beta testing your product, right? So I get that. But there is this whole sort of industry of suppliers, people who are writing articles and blog posts and 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 are coaches and are speakers and are giving their talks um, in various places that 
gloss over the reality uh, of the fact that most businesses fail and that there's a study out of Harvard Business School uh, by a professor named Shikhar Ghosh that shows that 70% of uh, startups fail. And that's fine. I mean, that's part of what it takes to build businesses. But if you don't realize that, and I see this all the time, you people, I was with a, a couple of entrepreneurs this morning who started this company without really appreciating the struggle. And so they went in with limited cash, limited runway, and now they're six to eight months into it. They've got a prototype. It sort of works. What are they going to do? Should they keep going full time? Should they ask their parents for more money? They're in this weird place because they've been kind of sold a bill of goods, I'd say. And now they realize, of course, that it's not as great as it looks on paper. Right. Entrepreneur, Entrepreneur Inc., uh, they sell the dream of entrepreneurship. They don't, they don't sell the, the hard stuff. And that's like, you're right. Passion plays a role, but at a certain point you have to, you have to move beyond passion and get to the nitty gritty. You do. And I hate, you know, I never want to be, I mean, you never want to sell yourself as like, I'm the pragmatic person. Cause then, you know, how, how exciting is that? But um, this whole concept of 10% entrepreneurship is in its DNA, really pragmatic. And a lot of times pragmatic isn't quite as exciting, but I, you know, I came out of, having invested in venture capital in startups in the first tech crash. And when I saw that, and then I went off to Harvard Business School, and I was deathly afraid of, of doing anything entrepreneurship related because I'd seen tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars lost. And I just thought to myself, you know, this isn't the life for me. And frankly, you know, I don't have family money to fall back on. I got to go out there and hustle and make money for myself. And so I actually was really afraid of it. And so the only way for me to get over that fear was to do things on an incremental basis. And what I realized when I did, which was kind of the part that kind of surprised me, was that yes, it was just 10%, but the impact it had in terms of the way I thought and my willingness to then engage with risk much more actively was outsized. Right. So what I love about the idea of the Tencent entrepreneur is like, as you said, it brings in more people to into the world of entrepreneurship that otherwise probably would stay out of it. And these include people who are older in their thirties, maybe have family, have a steady job. I mean, why should even people, I mean, I guess you, you have, you, your life, your life study, life story gives a perfect example why you should dabble in entrepreneurship, even if you have a steady job, because your steady job probably isn't really a steady job. Exactly. And, and I, I think about, and it may be that you have, a, a, you've got a, a career path that you're set on and you're doing well in, but you just end up, I mean, look at me in 2008, look at all the people on Wall Street. But I also, there's a guy in the book whose story I love, uh, his name's Peter Barlow. He was a lawyer at a firm here in New York City, and he did transportation law. And he had actually done some things on the side with a, a car business. He started a luxury car brokerage with a couple friends. Then he got this once in a lifetime opportunity to go be the general counsel of a startup airline. And this thing was funded by Morgan Stanley. I mean, all the, all the chips were aligned. And then 2008 came along, the whole thing blew up. He went back to his law firm and he said, that's it. I'm never doing this again. But a couple uh, months later, he was on a flight and he met a guy who was starting a new car rental company who needed help. And Peter had worked with air, airplanes. He had worked with cars and he was sort of like car rental airports. Like this is right in my wheelhouse. He ended up getting involved early on as an advisor, got founder's equity, was an angel investor from day zero. That company is now called Silver Car. It's a company that's raised over $30 million of venture capital. It's got Eduardo Severin from Facebook in there. They've got over 1,000 cars at over 10 airports across the USA. And Peter has been able to generate upside in a way he never could have at the law firm, but he's still managing partner of his office. So he likes his job. It's not that he says, you know, I hate being a lawyer. He likes being a lawyer, but he would have never had the opportunity to create the kind of value that he has at Silver Car if he had just kept his head down working at the firm. Right. So it, it, being an entrepreneur on the side, it diversifies your your uh, finance, your finances, right? So if something ha bad happens, you have something to fall back on, but it also just gives you extra income that you use to pay down debt, you know, fund your lifestyle that you want for your family. But another thing you talk about, uh, the benefit of being an entrepreneur, even on the side, even when you have a full-time job, is that it can actually make you a more valuable employee at your day job. Uh, how's that possible? So... One of the things that's kind of interesting is that people, um, when they think about entrepreneurship, they forget the fact, you know, in many jobs today, you know, we always think about, well, you need to be entrepreneurial to succeed in the world of startups. But in many jobs today, uh, whether you're Goldman Sachs or if you're at a manufacturing company in the Midwest, 
you need to think like an entrepreneur because technology is disrupting so many industries so quickly. And if companies aren't nimble, they're not going to stay ahead of the game. And as an employee, you really need to take responsibility for your education as an entrepreneur. There was this interesting article in the New York Times about AT&T, and they have all their employees reading books and taking classes on their own time to learn how to think like an entrepreneur. And it made me laugh a little bit because you can read as many books as you want. You can read mine three times over, but unless you go out into the world and put those things uh, into action, you're never going to actually learn what it means because you have to take a little risk and you have to feel uh, both the risk of failure and also the sort of excitement of upside and you have to see what works and what doesn't for you. And so, um, and so as a result, people who do these things actually develop a skill set and a mindset that is very valuable. And I've seen it in a bunch of different industries. So I have one good friend who I wanted to put in the book, but he wasn't comfortable having his name out there. But he works at a big private equity firm, and he invests in big consumer companies, companies we all buy stuff from all the time. But on the side, he's invested in a bunch of really cool startups in that space. And so he knows what's going on at the cunning edge of his industry. And he's invested in the kinds of companies that he'll probably be investing in in 10 years down the line at his big firm. And at the same time, I have a, another story that I did put in the book uh, about a guy named Gabe Haim. He's a car dealer in Long Island, and he started a, a, a beer company, um, Oyster Bay Brewing. And you know, obviously, Art Emanuelis, we Manuelis, we all love our beer, right? And so Gabe started this microbrewery, and he has basically used his all the things that he developed, the, the relationships and the skills at his day job to build this business on the side. But that's also made him much more well-known in the community and it's fed back into his day job. So it's all very symbiotic. And I think that's what great 10% entrepreneurs do is they find projects that build upon what they're good at and then allow them to channel all the things they're getting back into the rest of their lives, their day jobs, their personal relationships, um, just to you know win kind of all over the place. Right. All right. So I think you made a case, a compelling case that being an entrepreneur on the side comes with a lot of upside. Uh, diversify your finances. You can make yourself a better employee at your just traditional day job that you enjoy. So how do you do this? Because I think when most people think entrepreneur, they think I got to be the guy who founds the company, who runs it day to day. Um, and that's like, that's a big time suck and a big money suck. Um, but you argue in the book, there's other ways you can be an entrepreneur and it doesn't require as much time or money commitment. So what are some of the ways you can be a 10% entrepreneur? Right. So there are five types of 10% entrepreneurs, and these will map to the particular uh, resources you have available. So if you think about it, what can you invest as an entrepreneur? You can invest your time, you can invest your money, if possible, and you can invest your knowledge, your skills, your, your, your human capital, as it were. And so as you think about those things, uh, then you need to sort of choose what kind of entrepreneur you're going to be in your part-time capacity. And so I lay out five, and I've actually done four of the five at this point, so I feel like I've got a good feel on them. Um, you can be more than one, but I, it's advisable to start with one. And so if you think about the five, the first is an angel. So many of you would know an angel investor is somebody who invests their capital in exchange for ownership in a business, right? Um, investing in startups, you know, with with some of your money, and and we can talk about how much money you need, but there's a real range because the cost of building businesses has gone down so much over the last ten years. The second is an advisor, and that's somebody who doesn't invest money but invests their time. Either they're a standing advisor giving a little time here or there, you know, maybe an hour a month, two hours a month, giving advice and relationships and things like that. Or it's somebody who has a particular skill. You know, I'm a carpenter and I build out your store, or I'm a web designer and I build out your app or something like that. The third is a founder, and that's somebody who does own and operate a business on the side. So it's that person who has a full-time job, but then has, you know, a full-time sort of side hustle as it were, or not full-time yet, but something that could potentially become full-time for them. And then the fourth and the fifth are types of 10% entrepreneurship. One is called the aficionado, and that's somebody who's a 10% entrepreneur, but they're doing it to explore a passion that they have that they maybe would love to do full-time in a perfect world, like being a chef or something. But they're not going to do because of the the realities of that job. Maybe you know they don't make enough money, or there's too high risk for them. So they invest, advise, or get involved with something where they can act in a professional capacity, do it as if they were a pro, but on their own time. 
And the final one is for all of you who are already entrepreneurs. Uh, this is the 110% entrepreneur. And it's somebody who is a 10% entrepreneur on the side as a way to diversify that big bet they've made in their entrepreneurial venture that they are running themselves. And so those will map to the resources that I mentioned earlier, you know, your, your money, your time, and your knowledge. So the way you figure out which route you go is depending on what you have more. If you have a lot more money than time, go the angel route. Yeah, I mean, it, it 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 goes back to where you want to spend your time and where you think it's most impactful. But for example, if you're a really really busy person, but you have some capital, that would be uh, the great place to start looking at angel investments because you'll start learning, you'll get involved, you can maybe join an angel group if you if you need help finding deal flow or if you're trying to learn yet uh, exactly how to do this. But it gets you started, and then along the course of your life, you won't be as busy all the time as you are today. People's lives have ebbs and they have flows. So perhaps later you'll be an advisor or maybe you can become a founder. If you don't have money right now or you're not comfortable with the risk of investing in a startup, then being an advisor is a great way to start because you can identify what you're good at and then trade that for ownership in a company. All right. So you mentioned briefly how you can find angel opportunities, um, you know, join an angel group. I mean, are there other places online where you can find companies who are looking for angel investment and how much money do you need to do? Because I think when most people think angel investors, they think like, you know, Peter Thiel or like, you know, these really, these multi-billionaires who just throw millions of dollars. Like, do you really need that much money or can you invest significantly less? So you can invest significantly less. And this was one of the things that I struggled with when I started out. So when I got going as an angel investor, I had, you know, I'd worked for a number of years. I had some savings and I was willing to invest, but I would go to these meetings and, you know, I was thinking, you know, how much do I have to give to these people um, to, be, to actually be taken seriously? And I remember hearing, oh, you need $100,000 to invest or something like that. And that's a lot of money. And so I felt really a little bit nervous, actually, about being honest about what I was willing to invest, whether it was, you know, 10,000 or 25 or five or 50 or whatever. And then I heard this great story about Dick Costolo, who is uh, one of the early investors in Twitter and went on to become CEO later on because his 10% got him a full-time job there. And he got this email from one of the founders saying, would you be willing to invest? You know, what, what do you think? 50, a hundred. And Dick Costolo had sold his company to Google. He's a very wealthy guy. And he said, you know, I think 25 is fine for me on this one. And he was one of the smaller investors, but his $25,000 investment became worth millions of dollars. And so what we see is that given the decline in the cost of building a new business, I mean, you think about building a website 10 years ago was hundreds of thousands of dollars. Today, it costs, you know, you can do it for as little as $10 a month. But uh, companies just don't need to raise as much money. And so I've seen people invest as little as a couple thousand dollars, all the way up to much more than that. In terms of finding the opportunities, uh, you, I always advocate that it's good to deal with people you've met in the real world. So you can certainly go to AngelList, and there are lots of opportunities there. I, um, we can talk about this later, how to select and, and validate which deals you should do. I'm a little nervous if I've never met the people that something is important to me, and I think it should be important to you. But I like to uh, advise people to either use their personal network or... They can also join an angel group. There are over 300 angel groups in the United States. There are angel groups all over the world. And these are groups of people with all kinds of different skills that come together, work together. You can learn from other people. There's lawyers in the group. There are people with different skills than yours. And so you come together and it helps you to make smarter decisions and learn because the apprentice, uh, investment is an apprenticeship business and, and working with other people who can teach you and help you along is always helpful. So yeah, going. how do you figure out what, to invest in or like whether the company is a good investment, what sort of due diligence do you do? That's the thing that freaks me out is like, okay, here's, write your check for a thousand dollars. My money's gone in two months. Yeah, exactly. So I, this is the longest chapter in the book and this is where, you know, a lot of business books have a really great idea and it's like a great headline, but then they don't give you the actual tools to do the things that they prescribe. And what I wanted to do when I wrote the book was to try to distill my entire career as a venture capitalist into advice in the book. And so I have this chapter, it's the longest chapter, and it, it, it sort of distills the experience that I've had. I've invested in over 30 companies in my career now, and I've looked at many hundreds. And so I, I distill it down to three 
big sets of questions. And in fact, if you go to my website, you can find, uh, you can, you can email me and I'll send you the list. I'm happy to give it to you. Anybody who's listening, um, as a freebie, what I, what I distill it down to is number one, uh, you know, really, what is this business? What does this business do? How is it successful? How does it make money? Why is this market interesting? And Obviously, if you have no knowledge of the industry or the market, then you're at a disadvantage to answer those questions. So I advise people to try to invest in areas where they have expertise or where they can build expertise. The second is about the team. Is this team uh, able to do the things it says it's going to do? Are these people honest? Do they have a good reputation? Are they going to be good partners to you? And if you're choosing a co-founder, say you want to run something full-time, is this co-founder somebody who you will be able to work with? So the, the team and the business are sort of, I would say, reasonably obvious things. There's nothing, I mean, if you don't do those things, then you're probably um, missing some, some big risk areas or areas for opportunity. But it's the third one that I think uh, as a 10% entrepreneur can set you apart. And it, it, for me, it's a bit of the secret sauce, which is really understanding your role. So I won't invest in a company unless I truly believe that I can move the needle in terms of revenues or bringing an investor or bringing a major insight or getting the company off the ground. And so as I look at businesses, I try to really think hard about how appropriate it is for me to be part of that business. And if I can't move the needle, I don't get involved because for me, that's the litmus test. If I can't move the needle, I don't know the business well enough. I don't know the people well enough. And that's really kept me out of trouble because so many times in Silicon Valley or in angel investment kind of environments, People follow other people. They're like wildebeest running across the Serengeti, just following blindly. And if you are doing that, you are asking for trouble. Right. I've had an opportunity, a few opportunities come my way. And it's funny that they always, the person pitching always is like, hey, so-and-so is also investing. And so-and-so is always, like, they, I think they understand the social pressure that can, can come in and getting you to, to, to pull the trigger on and writing them a check. Definitely. And the scary part is, this is the part that really gets to me. It's fine. Like, say you're best friends with Peter Thiel and Peter Thiel is investing. And well, that's, you know, that, that's a good place to be. But Peter Thiel may have invested, but you may never get a call back if you're just Joe anybody, right? One of the things that we have to, as you mentioned, is you invest your money. It's gone in a couple months. I love entrepreneurs, but they're busy people. And I don't want to piss anybody off here, but sometimes they're a little flaky and you may not be their top priority. So if you can't make an impact in your business, you may not get that call back later on. And so if you are a part of them, what they're doing and, and you are part of creating value and you are not just a remote control investor, you are going to be much more integrated into what is going on with the company and you're going to know a lot more what's going on and you're going to have opportunities to maybe become an advisor later on or maybe invest more money later on. So it's really about building that long-term relationship with people who you can do deals with for the rest of your career. And are there any like tax or regulatory issues someone might need to be aware of when investing in a startup? Because I, I, I thought there was like some sort of limit. Like you had to like the SEC said you had to have like at least a million dollar net worth before you can invest or is that not the case? So it's a little tricky. It's uh, and this is something that I would encourage everybody to read up on, because I, if I were to give you sort of the whole story, we'd be here for another four hours. But basically, if a company is doing a general solicitation, so it's somebody who's put together a book and is going to strangers, then it must only market that company to accredited investors. So if it's getting angel investors, those people must. I believe the test is you must have two hundred fifty thousand of income or a million dollars in the bank in order to invest. However, there are a couple of exceptions that are really critical that make it that most people are able to invest if they want to. The first is if you know the people already, then it's not considered a general solicitation and so those people can invest. So it's, it's if your mom and dad want to invest in your company, they don't have to worry about that rule. The second is the Jobs Act uh, has actually liberalized some of these things and there are, there are certain uh, very relaxed rules about your ability to invest and, and, and you don't have to meet certain thresholds to put, put, put money in at lower amounts. So it's, it's become much more flexible. Um, but what I would tell people is even if you don't have the money to make an investment as an angel, you can still become a 10% entrepreneur by using your time, which these days, capital isn't usually the problem for startups. The problem is expertise, talent, and resources. And therefore, trading your time and your skills can be as impactful or more impactful than capital alone. 
Well, yeah, let's talk about the, the advisor role. So how do you set up those? I mean, how do you find advisor opportunities and how do you set up the, the arrangement for that? So the advisor uh, a role is pretty standard these days, actually, in in, in the world of startups. And it's interesting. Um, the, the story I love to tell about the advisor role, because people say to me, well, what do you mean? Like, what kinds of things could one trade? There's a great story about uh, an artist named David Choi, and he did a mural at the Facebook headquarters in, uh, in, in Silicon Valley, and they were going to pay him in cash, I don't know how much, maybe $10,000, $20,000, but he took stock instead. And when Facebook went public, it was worth several hundred million dollars, right? So that's, that's an example of an advisory position that is, it's a little bit of a, a, a different position, but it can be that you would trade something like that in exchange for stock. But what typically happens is that when startups are looking to uh, grow and, and expand, they can't afford to hire all the people they need on their team, right? They just don't have the resources yet. And so they're looking for people who can bring those skills to the table, but can do so in a flexible way. So either they need, you know, that expert in sales who can come in and give them a couple of or advice every once in a while. Two, they need that person who can build the financial model or design the marketing plan or build the website, maybe working on a project basis for a couple of weeks here and there. And so when that happens, um, you know, in order to position yourself for that, if you're interested in doing that, what you really need to do is identify what is it that you bring to the table and then network and start talking to advisors, uh, people who are looking for advisors, and just be in the startup scene and Give advice and, and, you know, don't come with your hand out necessarily in that first meeting, but just try to meet people and explain to them how you could be impactful to them, right? Um, in terms of in terms of actually putting those deals together, um, the, these are not particularly controversial at this point. Uh, somebody who spends a couple hours a month working with a startup gets in between 0.25% to as much as 1% that will best over a couple of years. So you will get a little bit of stock every month, making sure you're doing what you say you're going to do. And then for somebody who does a project-based uh, advisory, you actually try to figure out what the market value is on that and then look at the value of the company today and you'll get paid in stock based on sort of the conversion of what you're doing to the value of the company today. What's really important uh, when you think about these advisory positions is that you want to, as somebody who's aspiring to be an advisor, you want to be out there mixing up with entrepreneurs because what happens is once you get one advisory position, and I've seen this with so many people that I know uh, who do this, once you get one, you get many. You, the phone starts ringing all the time. So the critical thing is to find the area where you have expertise, meet people who do that, and then get that first position. Can you do this sort of thing with businesses that don't plan on having stocks, right? Like they don't plan on creating shares. It's a privately held business, but you know, maybe there's is like a profit share thing you could possibly do. Or is, I mean, are you just limited to startups with stock options? No, I think that's actually, it's, it's a great question and one that I've never had before. So it, you can do that. In fact, one of the people who um, I know who has been a very successful 10 percenter is a guy who invested in a bar. And so they're never going to, take a bar public or they're never going to um, do a big sale, but he owns a percentage of the, of the bar and the bar pays dividends every month. So he invested in this thing. And this is a bar in New York City. It's a sports bar. He invested not a ton of money in this thing uh, five or 10 years ago. I can't remember quite when, but he actually lost his job and the bar ended up keeping him afloat for a while because he was getting those monthly dividends. So it can be that you are partaking in the cash flows as well. And that, that can be a really great way to create some current income for yourself. It's so like a good arrangement for that be. So like, you know, if you were an advisor position on a company like that, would it be like 1% or 2%? I mean, what, what would something be fair? Well, if I would think about it this way, I really, obviously it's very situational because, you know, you could also be involved in helping somebody structure a real estate deal, which is also something that would be maybe you get part of the dividends or the cash flow. But what I would do, say you and I, I meet you, you're opening a bar and I am a, I design menus and I design cocktail menus or something like that. And I do this for you. And, and I typically would charge a, a client $5,000 to do that. And I think about your bar and I say, you know, I think your bar at this point, you know, let's figure out what you think it's going to make this year. You think it's going to cash flow a half a million dollars. You know, why don't you, um, you, you gave me 
I assume 5,000 is, I think it's about 1% if I'm doing my math right of 500,000. Give me 1% of your bar. And, you know, granted, you're not paying me up front today. So I'm going to give you this kind of deal today and then I'm going to take equity instead of cash, but then I'm going to get paid going forward for a long time. So I'm kind of becoming a part of your business. I may continue advising you going forward on everything that has to do with your bar. And then I'm your partner. And uh, that would be one way to do it. And we sit down, we negotiate, and we, we figure out what you think I'm worth and, and how much time I want to spend. And we have that conversation. And that's the beginning of a business partnership that could evolve in many different directions. Very cool. I like that. That's awesome. I like how we're broadening to be beyond just startups. Well, um, Patrick, so, I mean, keeping track of whether you're spending 10% of your money, this is the whole idea of the 10% entrepreneur. You want to spend just 10% of your time or money um, on these entrepreneurial 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 endeavors, excuse me. Um, so how do you make sure that you're spending just 10% of that? I mean, I think the money is easy because you just look at your, your monthly finances. Okay. I'm spending 10%, but what about time? Cause I, I can see, I can see that being something that just sucks up a lot of time without you even realizing it. It can be, you know, I say a minimum of 10%. So I, I do account for the very real situations where people, a lot of people get to 10%. They start at 10%, especially with time. And then they realize how much they love what they're doing on the side and they get their family involved and their best friends and then they end up maybe even going full time, right? So one of the cool things about doing 10% entrepreneurship is you know, I have a, a story in the book about a guy named Luke Holden who had a lobster roll company and he did it temp- really 10%. He actually brought in a partner who could work full time and he was it was just 10% for him. Then they opened their first store and, and their $35,000 investment paid back in 17 days. And then they opened a second store a year later and he joined full time. So for him, 10% was a starting point. But I have lots of other people who stay around 10%. And I think the critical thing that you need to do with the 10% is realize it's not necessarily going to be 10% of every day or every week. It's a general sort of allocation you're making of your mindset and that you need to do things that are closely related. You think about, you know, Chris Gillibo talks about, I was listening to your podcast with him. He talks about flow and the fact that you're doing something that you're good at and it just feels natural to you. When you're doing something that, where you have flow, 10% can be very impactful. And so what I like to do and the way that I kind of keep on top of these things is I really look for areas where I have flow. But the second thing I do is I actually really think a lot about time and I think about how I spend my time. And one of the activities that I have in the book is actually sitting down and writing down how you spend your time. And when I did that, I realized that I was watching a heck of a lot more TV than I probably wanted to. So I canceled cable and gave that time over to uh, my 10%. But I, I do think that you know at the, at the end of the day, you may find that your 10% become such a passion that it goes to 20 or 30 or even 100. And that's okay, as long as you're not neglecting the other things in your life you care about, like your family and your health. And of course, your day job. Um, you clearly want to keep uh, respecting and doing a great job at, your, job at your day job, because that's what it pays for and allows for all of the 10% you do on the side. So yeah, there, there might reach a point where you're doing the 10% entrepreneurship thing. And um, you, you had that decision to make whether to go full time. How do you decide whether to do that? And why would you decide not to go full time, even though you possibly could? It's a great question. And what's cool about doing things on the side and then maybe deciding if you're going to go full time is that by doing something on the side, you have de-risked the entire proposition to a point where you're making a pretty smart decision based on data. So there's a, a great study out of the University of Wisconsin that shows that people who launch a side business and then do it full time are 50% more successful than people who just jump in full time and try to make a go of it. Because when you do something on the side, you give yourself runway to figure out if your assumptions are correct and if this thing actually makes sense from a business perspective before you go in and do it full time, right? And so when you're thinking about jumping in full time, the advice that I always give to people and you know what I've seen with, with people who've made that transition is, first of all, if you're going to do it full time, you want to know that it provides the basic lifestyle that is acceptable to you. So if you've got a high cost basis and then you jump into a, a project where you're not making enough to pay for your lifestyle, puts a lot of pressure on you, on your business, on your family, on everything. So you want to at least make sure you're, you're able to live a life that is acceptable, yeah? The second thing is if you get to the point where you cannot continue 
maintaining a 10%. It's just getting, going too quick, but you can't quite live off of it. The question there really comes down to, are you going to find somebody who can help you, maybe bring in a partner? And I've seen that happen a lot. Or are you going to slow down the business's growth until it gets to a point financially where you could actually consider leaving full time? Now, many people won't ever leave full time. As you mentioned, some people, you know, why wouldn't you leave full time? And I think for some people, their 10% are just that. There's something that gives them something they would never have at their day job, but they really like their day job. They like that stability. And there's a great guy that I met as I was interviewing people um, named Steve Siegel, and he's a big executive at CBRE, the, the real estate company. He's head of global brokerage, um, and he's been in that business for a long time. He's very successful. But over the course of his life, for the last nearly 50 years, he's been doing 10%. He's done everything from hotel investments to buying um, into investments in properties in Manhattan. He's an investor in PJ Clark's the restaurant chain. He even invested in a minor league baseball team. And when I asked him, I said, Steve, you know, you have hundreds of investments. You clearly could go and just do this full time. Why don't you do it? His answer to me was, number one, I love what I do for a living. It allows me the flexibility to make all these investments on the side. But number two, you know, I just see this as an extension of everything else I'm doing. I have my 10%. I will always have them no matter what happens in my day job. But it's not, you know, for me, I like having that corporate lifestyle. I love being part of a big organization where I have all these relationships that come to me and I'm able to just do more by combining all of these things together. And so he has kind of this super amazing model where he's got, you know, all his 10%, his 100%, and it adds up to a heck of a lot more than 110 that's great. Well, hey, Patrick, this has been a great conversation. Where can people learn more about your book? So you can uh, learn more about my book at patrickmcginnis.com, uh, M-C-G-I-N-N-I-S.com. You can also, if you go there, you can actually download a free chapter and you can take a quiz to see what kind of 10% entrepreneur you should be. You can also find me on Twitter at PJ McGinnis and on Facebook at The 10% Entrepreneur. Perfect. Well, Patrick McGinnis, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. My guest today was Patrick McGinnis. He's the author of the book, The 10% Entrepreneur. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can also find more information and get a free chapter from his book at patrickmcginnis.com. Also check out the show notes at aom.is slash 10% for links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.